so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's 9pm on New Year's Eve 1927 and Ethel Griggs and her baby daughter Alwyn have just returned home to Victoria after six months away. They've been staying with her parents in Tasmania, where the 21-year-old has been thinking long and hard about her marriage. She believes her husband, Ronald Griggs, is having an affair with a pretty parishioner from his church called Lottie. The couple had been fighting about it lots, and Ethel was miserable. She'd asked him for a divorce, but he'd refused. Instead, Ronald had suggested some distance told his wife to take the baby and go away for a while. Back home now in Omeo, Ethel joins her husband in the kitchen. He's made her some supper after the long journey. Some cheese sandwiches, buttered bread and a pot of tea. She has a nibble and a sip, but she doesn't feel well and quickly runs out the back door to vomit. Ronald offers to put their daughter to sleep and tells his wife to have a bath and get to bed. Ethel doesn't get better. In just over 48 hours, she will be dead. At first, it's thought to be heart trouble that took the young mother's life. Ronald suggests it might even be linked to Ethel's seasickness from the arduous boat trip home. But just two weeks after Ethel is laid to rest, police order for her body to be exhumed. They were right to be suspicious. Inside her stomach they made a startling discovery. Enough arsenic to kill not just Ethel, but several people. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. By February 1928... 28-year-old Ronald Griggs sat in a tiny cell in his town's lockup. He'd gone from living a respectable life in the town's parsonage to being a confessed adulterer and accused wife killer, arrested on the same day as his daughter's first birthday. Griggs' alleged sins enraged his community, and police were genuinely concerned he might be lynched by a vigilante mob before his case could be heard. The trial that was to follow was described at the time as one of the greatest court dramas in Australia's history. Griggs and his young lover Lottie were the talk of the country, with newspapers following their every move. But despite the convincing evidence and the means, motive and opportunity that pointed to Griggs being a murderer, two separate juries set him free. This is a true crime story that is as shocking today as it was in 1928 and is one that our guest today has explored intimately on his podcast, Forgotten Australia. Author and podcaster Michael Adams joins us now. Michael, can you give us a bit of a background on who Ethel White was prior to meeting her husband? Ethel was a lovely, from all accounts, young woman who was working as a teacher in Tasmania in the fairly rugged, remote areas southwest of Hobart. So back in the day, this is the early 1920s, you graduated school, you'd be 17 years old, and you'd go and start teaching. So she was teaching these kids in these little schoolhouses in southwestern Tasmania. And by all accounts, she was a charming, polite, religious smart young woman who was getting on with life as a school teacher and I guess you know hoping that she would meet the man of her dreams and get married and live in that part of Tasmania. 17 year old school teacher I think that's one thing before we keep going that you know as someone living in 2023 when you look back at this time frame everyone's so young (laughs) they do everything so young. That's right. I mean, you're a 17 year old school teacher, but you might go to a restaurant and you might meet a 19 year old chap who's come back from the Great War or, you know, has been a boy soldier when he was, you know, 15 years old or 16 years old. So it did feel like people's lives 
was sped up compared to ours. I feel we have the luxury of time compared to these people. I mean, it was also necessity. You know, you went to school, you finished school maybe at 14, and then you were expected to work and support your family. I mean, Ethel's family were sort of working class people, so she would have had to support them Mm. and support herself as soon as she was able. So that's what she was doing. So a few years later, so she's still a young woman, just out of her teens, How did she meet Ronald Griggs? Ronald Griggs was from a wealthier family. On both his maternal and paternal sides, he had pioneer stock and they had helped to build this part of Tasmania. So his people went back to the 1840s. They were devout Methodists and Ronald had gone to the war as a young man. He arrived too late to actually serve to see action, but he'd had an experience with a sex worker in France who'd actually spoken to him about Jesus Christ. And he had this kind of epiphany, this moment of revelation in France that he wanted to devote himself to God. So he'd returned to Tasmania and he decided to become a Methodist minister. And he'd done sort of the initial training and exams for this and scored really well. So he'd been given probationary minister's position and was starting to preach in these little towns in Tasmania. And he was assigned to Wilmot, where Ethel was then a teacher. And they got to know each other in, I think it was 1923, began dating. But he was off sort of preaching all over Tasmania. So it was sort of a bit of a long distance relationship for a while there. And did her family approve of the union? They thought Ronald was terrific. Ronald was well-spoken. He he talked a good game about what he'd done in the war. So he said he'd been a boy soldier and gone over there and worked as a dispatch runner and had all of these near-death encounters on the Western Front, and that was very impressive. Not true, but very (laughs) impressive. (laughs) Which we find out later. (laughs) Yeah, as it would be revealed later. He kind of talked up what he'd done beyond the actual experiences he'd had. So they thought he was really impressive. They were delighted that their daughter was dating this guy. And again, particularly because, you know, he came from this Methodist stock and these people, these ancestors who went back generations. I mean, on his mother's side, the family name was Jeeves. And there's actually a place in southwestern Tasmania called Jeeveston, named for the family. And, you know, you'd go to this town and virtually everybody there was a Jeeves. So it was almost like Ethel was transcending her working class roots to join, I guess, what you'd call southwestern Tasmanian royalty by being with this guy to some extent. So Ethel and Ronald got married. What was their early married life like? By 1926, when they got married, he had progressed on his career path to becoming a fully-fledged Methodist minister. So he was a probationary minister and he was going to be assigned to a town. So they got married and almost immediately they left Tasmania for Victoria. He was assigned to be a preacher in Omeo, which is in eastern Victoria, about 250 miles, 400 kilometres northeast of Melbourne above Gippsland, a fairly remote town that had been first settled when gold had been discovered and had since become a place where there were a lot of fairly wealthy pastoralists and a lot of them were Methodists. So he was going to go there and become the new preacher in this little town. I mean, at the time, it had a population of about 2,200. These days, its population is only 400. So it's a, a little alpine village, fairly remote. He was arriving as the new preacher. So he had a an instant in in terms of a social community. He was going to be talking to parishioners, to congregants. He was going to be going out and making himself known. They would live in the parsonage, which was attached to the church there, but Ethel would be by herself in the parsonage and she fell pregnant very quickly after they arrived. So back in the day, again, you know, the idea for a woman when she was pregnant was to rest, to be indoors, to be confined, as the term was, It seems that she was fairly isolated almost from the start. No one in the town would say that they knew her well. Even her next-door neighbour, Annie Mitchell, said, you know, she'd had Ethel over for tea a few times, but she herself had never been inside the parsonage to have a, a reciprocal cuppa. So it seems like Ethel was sort of fairly isolated, whereas Ronald was trying to make himself the new preacher man around town. And his duties involved preaching not only at the church there, but at other little churches in the district. So he could get to those on horseback. He loved riding horses. 
he also bought himself a motorcycle with a sidecar. So he'd zip off on Sundays, you know, he'd have the service in Omeo and then he'd zip off to these other little far-flung communities and hold services there. I want to point out in the 1920s, even if Ethel hadn't fallen pregnant, there was no way she was able to work even in Omeo as a married woman, was there? No, no. So she'd been a teacher, but for much of the 20th century in Australia, a woman who was employed in public service had to give up her job when she got married. Mm. So she could no longer teach, that's for sure. I mean, I guess she could have taken a job in a shop or something like that, but it was not really the done thing, particularly as a preacher's wife, as a reverend's wife. I mean, he was being paid reasonably well for the time. So she was expected to, you know, be the dutiful wife to the holy man to take care of the parsonage and to raise their children. I mean, it's hard enough being pregnant with a community, whereas Ethel was pregnant with really no one around her. She'd moved to a new place. She was all alone. She was experiencing something she'd never experienced for the first time. You can kind of put yourself in her shoes and it would have been really lonely. It would have been hard. I think so, you know, and she's 20 years old. She's very young. Mm. And like you say, yeah, she's isolated. I mean, these days... If you or I had to move to a remote community, it would be tough where we don't know anybody except for our partner, but we could hop on Zoom, we could get on the phone, all of that sort of stuff. I mean, they didn't have the phone on in the parsonage, for starters. Radio was only in its infancy and hadn't reached Omeo then. So, you know, yeah, she was isolated socially, but also in terms of communication, you know, to contact her family, who she was very close to in Tasmania, was, you know, a letter and that would take a week to get there and then for them to respond and come back another week. So, yeah, the, the sort of image I got was that she was quite isolated, quite lonely, but, you know, probably also that she'd known that was going to be the case. I mean, you know, when her husband was training to be a reverend, they'd actually requested to post to the islands as missionaries. So I think she was prepared for this sort of life. What she wasn't prepared for was for her husband's extracurricular activities. I mean, that would have been a huge shock and a, a real insult given the sacrifices she was making. The activities you're talking about are a young woman called Lottie Condon. Tell us about her. When did Ronald come across Lottie? Almost immediately upon arriving. So one of the stalwarts of the Methodist community around Omeo was John Condon. He was a farmer. He had a large family. Again, much like Ronald's people back in Tasmania, they went back generations. They were pillars of the community. And Ronald and Ethel visited the Condon's farm and were invited to stay overnight to break bread. And the daughter, Lottie Condon, was a year younger than Ethel. So she was about 19 at this point. She was very good looking, tall, dark haired. She kind of dressed in very stylish 20s clothes. You know, if you imagine a 20s flapper with the little hats and the short hair and all that sort of stuff, that was how she dressed, at least in the photos that we have. So she was a striking young woman. She wasn't a party animal. She, you know, was a good religious girl. She liked wholesome activities, including horse riding, which really endeared her to Ronald. And, you know, the sort of activities she would do would be social dances and things like that around the community, maybe going to the pictures. So she was a, a good girl. She was a beautiful girl. And Ronald was immediately struck by her and became desperately infatuated with her. Now, Ronald, you know, not to be cruel, was no Brad Pitt. He was, you know, a short little dude. He'd have been rejected initially for the army because he was so short and sort of slight. He had receding hair. He was described in really quite unflattering terms in the newspapers of the day, but he clearly had something, and I think this something was the gift of the gab, the ability to talk, to convince, to sway people, and that's what he did as a preacher. His sermons were highly valued by the various congregations that he served. So I think that he probably was quite a mesmeric figure for Lottie as well. He would say that his marriage to Ethel had soured almost immediately upon arriving in Omeo, that she wasn't interested in sexual relations, that she was cranky with him and all of this sort of stuff, and he couldn't for the life of him fathom why. The obvious answer was that he was only had eyes for Lottie Condon from almost day one. So he would deny that there was any impropriety whatsoever going on between them, but Ethel 
increasingly called him out on it, said, you know, what are you doing? Why are you so interested in this girl? Stop it. People are talking. He denied, denied, denied. Did she ever find them in a compromising position or was there any kind of run-in with the three of them? Yes, there were several and they were quite public. So Ethel actually invited Lottie to come and stay at the parsonage. And this is really a tragic thing in my mind for a young wife to invite the woman who's going to be her sort of nemesis to come and stay with them. And the fact that they were only a year apart in age suggests to me that Ethel thought that Lottie might be a friend. Mm. He invited her to come and stay at the parsonage just after Christmas in 1926. And Ethel came down and found Lottie and her husband sitting very close together and he was rubbing her neck in the mm. kitchen. And she's like, what's going on? And her husband, Ronald, says, nothing's going on. She's just got a bit of a headache and I'm trying to, you know, help her out here. <laughs> Ethel was not a stupid girl. She didn't believe it and, you know, she created a scene and she would later tell her sister that Ronald had physically kicked her out of the kitchen and then he kind of gaslit her. He continued to deny anything was happening. He was zipping all over town, all over the district with Lottie in the sidecar of his motorbike and they were going for horse rides together. A road worker saw them sort of hand in hand, arms around each other on horses that were trotting side by side, pretty much out in the open. And there was a scene in Omeo Township in a shop there. Ethel was in the shop and she saw Ronald pull up outside with his motorbike and Lottie in the sidecar and they came in and Ronald said to Ethel, you should go home, I'm going to take you home. She said, you can go home with the one you're with, leave me alone, I'll see you later. So there were several confrontations and by this stage Ethel was heavily pregnant. Mm. This is something that comes up a bit later and is disputed, but Ronald claims that around this time Ethel was making a few threats of suicide. What do we know about that? He claimed that just after this confrontation in the shop, it's the middle of summer, supposedly they've got a blazing fire in their bedroom in the fireplace and Ethel supposedly says she's going to throw herself into the fire, which has got to be the strangest way to commit suicide I've ever heard of. And then when he restrains her, she supposedly asks a question about whether the rope that's downstairs is going to be strong enough for her to hang herself. But these claims only came from Ronald, mm. They're not corroborated by anybody else, and they only came later. There was another scene which the neighbour saw where Ethel was wandering around in the paddock in the rain, sort of in a state of distress. And Ronald went next door and got this neighbour and said, try and help me talk her into coming inside and that Ethel wouldn't say anything to the neighbour. He later would claim that this was another indication of her unsound mind and that she was suicidal. To me, it's more likely that this woman who's pregnant, heavily pregnant, is just really distressed that, you know, her husband, the minister, is back in the house with a girlfriend, you know, posing as this man of the cloth, this holy roller, when he's, you know, an adulterer. That would strike me as something that might cause you to walk around in the paddock in a state of distress rather than indicating that you're necessarily suicidal. Ethel had her baby in the February of 1927, so not long after all of this stuff that we're talking about. Was that a happy time for the couple, a new start? You know, you've got this beautiful baby girl. You would have thought so, but he apparently didn't take to the child particularly. She hoped that he would come around to the baby a bit later, but he didn't seem to show much interest and he didn't desist in his relationship with Lottie Condon. She said to him, okay, I've had enough. I want a divorce. He said, no, you should go to Tasmania. Take the baby, go to Tasmania. We'll have it some time apart. And she was about to leave and he changed his mind and said, no, no, stay. But then. Lottie went off to Wagga Wagga for a few months. He drove down to see her. The reason for Lottie's time away in Wagga Wagga was put down to her having a quote-unquote nose operation. It's also quite possible that she was pregnant and was going there to get an abortion. Oh. Because, you know, obviously at the time abortion was illegal, access to a doctor in Omeo would have been very limited. So if you were going to do something that dangerous and that illegal, it would be far smarter to do it out of town. So she was away for a couple of months. So it does seem that at this time, with Lottie away, Ronald tried to at least have the appearance of a happy family, didn't send his wife away. 
But then things did not improve. Lottie returned and he basically said, you need to go to Tasmania for six months, have a think about things, and then we'll decide what we're going to do after that in terms of separation. The big problem being is if they got divorced, particularly on the grounds of his misconduct, he could never become a fully fledged reverend. He could never ascend the Methodist ranks. He would be persona non grata in any religion, any Christian religion at the time. So a divorce was pretty much from his point of view, career-wise, out of the question. So Ethel took the baby to Tasmania. She spent six months there in the second half of 1927, and she spent time with her family. She spent time with his family. From the accounts that her family later gave, she was in pretty good spirits. She'd been in a little bit of ill health when she first turned up, but she improved. To her mother and to everybody else, she gave no indication there was any trouble back at home, but she did speak to her sister and she told her sister that her husband Ronald was carrying on with this Lottie Condon woman, that they'd been doing stuff in the kitchen, that she'd been physically kicked out of the kitchen. But what she hoped was that when she returned, he'd have it out of his system and in any case he was due to be moved from Omeo and they were going to go and the next posting would be a missionary position in the islands. So she hoped that she'd return, they'd have a reconciliation, and then they'd move somewhere far away from Lottie and far away from temptation. That was what she told her sister in secret. Back in Omeo, Ronald and Lottie were carrying on enough that the town was talking about it. They seemed to think they were invisible, that no one knew. I mean, certainly her father didn't know, but various townspeople had seen them and tongues were wagging. He sent a telegram to his wife in Tasmania and said, I'm sending you the money for the return fare to Victoria, so come back when you want to. And she did. She decided to come back just after Christmas, but she didn't send him a telegram until she was already on the way with the baby. So he didn't have a chance to sort of say, hey, 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 no, stay. And he'd been with Lottie right up to the 30th of December and Ethel and the baby arrived on New Year's Eve, turned up at the parsonage, and he said, hey, good to see you. Come in. The baby looks well. Well, he hasn't seen it for most of its life. (laughs) That's right. He hasn't seen it for, yeah, exactly, most of its life. Come in. Let me grab the bags, have a cup of tea and, and some refreshments. So it was like a cordial reunion kind of thing. According to Ronald, so this is the thing we need to remember is, Almost everything that we hear from this point on is only from Ronald's point of view and only Ronald's story. It's not really corroborated by anybody else. What happens in the next 48 hours at least? You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with author Michael Adams about the poison death of Ethel Greeks. So she arrives back at their home in Omeo at about 9pm on New Year's Eve. He prepares some refreshments, some tea, some sandwiches, and then what happens? She gets very, very sick very, very quickly. She's vomiting within sort of an hour. She can't finish the meal. She says that she's had some seasickness on the ferry across from Tasmania, and that was corroborated by a stewardess on the ferry. He said she'd had some minor seasickness in the first few hours but had been fine afterwards. Ethel and Alwyn, the baby, had then stayed in Melbourne overnight in a hotel there and then they'd gotten a train and then a car up to Omeo and there were a lot of passengers that she'd spoken to on this part of the voyage and they all said she seemed to be quite well health-wise and in good spirits. So there was no indication her seasickness had lingered. But according to Ronald, she came into the house, said she felt unwell. He gave her the cup of tea and the sandwiches and then she was profusely sick, vomiting. He put her to bed. He said he took care of the baby. And then on New Year's Day, he gave her more refreshments, more tea, etc. He went out and did his religious duties and her condition kind of wavered. She'd feel a bit better and then she'd be really sick again, vomiting. Then she'd feel a bit better. She found it impossible to sleep because she was so nauseous. What's also worth noting is that while he'd told Lottie that his wife was coming back, 
He hadn't told anybody else in the community. So no one else in Omeo had any idea that Ethel had returned to the parsonage until he eventually went to his neighbor and said, you know, can you help me with my wife? She's very, very sick. And then he subsequently then also went to the doctor in Omeo and said, I think you need to come and, and have a look at her. Was the doctor able to help at all? The doctor said that she had been seasick and then she had a goiter. So he believed that the goiter put strain on the heart and she was basically exhausted from the seasickness and it had kind of become a vicious cycle. All she needed to really do was to rest and take some sort of anti-nausea medicine. So Ronald went to the pharmacy and got various concoctions, which are almost like stuff you'd take over the counter these days for indigestion. Mm -hmm. He gave that to Ethel. It didn't really help. She couldn't keep a lot of it down. The doctor also gave her a shot of morphia, a low dose of morphine to help her sleep and said, you know, she'll be fine. Once she's had some rest, she'll return to health. So Ethel died in the early hours of January 3. How was that discovered? Was that Ronald that found her dead? Ronald said that, you know, the doctor gave her the shot of morphia, then she went off to sleep. He'd been also run ragged looking after her supposedly in the past sort of 48 hours. He finally got the baby to sleep. He got to sleep himself and then he woke up maybe 2 a.m. The baby was crying. He got the baby back off to sleep and then thought he'd go and check on Ethel. She didn't appear to be breathing. He couldn't believe it. He ran next door and got his neighbour and said, I think Ethel's dead. Can you come and check her? The dude was like, well, I'm not a doctor. I don't know anything more than you do. Let's call the doctor. And he said, no, no, please come and check her. And there was a bit of to and fro about this and the guy eventually came in and they held a mirror beneath Ethel's nose and there was no condensation. So she really didn't seem to be breathing. But the neighbour didn't know. He said, look, we need to get the doctor. So they went and fetched the doctor. The doctor came up and was like, I cannot believe it. She's dead. You know, I gave her the smallest dose of morphine. She should have been fine. He couldn't understand it. Ronald would very quickly on the side say to the neighbour, I think the doctor gave her an overdose. Yet he wouldn't pursue this. Even though he'd said it, he wouldn't pursue this. He wouldn't demand an inquest, anything like that. And the neighbour actually said, you shouldn't say that. He said, no, you're right. I shouldn't, but I feel it's true. What he wanted to do, though, before anybody else, is he wanted to actually get on his motorbike and ride down to the Condon farm to inform them that his wife had died. His wife was literally not cold. She was, had only been dead an hour or two at the most, and he wanted to go and tell his girlfriend about this, which is just did not look good for him later when this was revealed, put it that way. So the doctor and Ronald had a chat. The doctor said, I think she's died of heart failure brought on by the goiter, brought on by the seasickness, brought on by the exhaustion of, you know, being so sick for two days. Ronald said, will you give me a death certificate? The doctor said, yes. He needed a death certificate to, you know, bury her for one, but also to claim the fairly small life insurance policy she'd had their whole lives together, 200 pounds, which was, you know, about as much as he would earn in a year. So it wasn't, you know, a huge motive for murder, that's for sure. Yeah, so that was it. The town of Omeo woke up to the news that A, Ethel was back, B, she was dead after a very short illness, and she was buried the next day. Ronald actually wanted to preside over that. He wanted to perform the ceremony, but he was talked out of it. His Methodist friend said, you know, you're too distraught. You should leave off. Another reverend performed the service. So that was that. Ethel had died of natural causes within three days of returning to Omeo and her poor grieving husband had to write a letter to the family to explain what had happened in her last hours. And the language that he used in this letter is just extraordinary. He basically said, you know, she couldn't have died in a more peaceful fashion and she's with God now. She, she went to sleep and she woke up in the garden of heaven and all of this sort of stuff, almost sort of saying, hey, it's a good thing that she's dead because, you know, she's at peace now. I mean, you can kind of understand it to some extent, given he was a preacher, that that's his job is to provide consolation. But it was a very strange, self-serving sort of communication because, you know, he also foregrounded his own suffering a lot in this letter. 
And he said, you know, to the family, if I can do anything for you, let me know. And they said, yes, you can. Ethel had actually said to us, if anything happens to her, she wanted us to take care of Alwyn. And he denied them that. He said, no, no, Alwyn, our daughter, will be with my people in Tasmania. So they were really, really unhappy about that. And, of course, in town, in Omeo, people were disquieted by the fact that, you know, he was now with Lottie Condon seemingly again trying to hide this relationship that they all knew was going on. And there were sufficient gossip that the Methodist elders heard about it, finally had to do something about it, and they called him up and had a special meeting and said, we're hearing all of these rumours about you and Lottie Condon. What's going on? And he said, absolutely nothing. She's only a friend. And her father, John Condon, confronted him and said, mate, what's going on with my daughter? And he said, nothing. And he said, do you swear to God? And Ronald said, I do, on my honour, on the Lord's name. Yes, there's nothing going on. We are only friends. This is just malicious gossip. And John Condon accepted that and believed him and said, well, you've got my full support because by this stage, local constable had kind of become a little bit suspicious about the sudden death of Ethel Griggs. He'd actually advised his superiors in Melbourne that it'd been this you know, sudden death. The preacher was carrying on with another woman what should he do? And they began to investigate Ronald Griggs and his movements, what he'd been up to. I want to bring Lottie in here because she actually gives the police a statement. What did she tell them? Well, the police started to investigate the circumstances of the death. The detective who was in charge from the Melbourne CIB was Detective Daniel Mulfay. Now, in 1920s Melbourne, there were two really, really famous cops, Frederick Piggott and John Brophy. And they were the guys who, you know, were at war with Squizzy Taylor a lot of the time. And there was this sort of, you know, little mantra that went, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If Piggott doesn't get you, Brophy must. The third wheel of that was Daniel Mulfay. He was an, a huge man. He was six foot four, 18 stone big hulking veteran detective who also tangled with Squizzy Taylor, had chased his share of murderers. But what made him really distinctive was he had this little waxed moustache, like really Hercule Poirot style. The papers of the day said he wears this preposterous wax moustache. <laughs> anyway, he was assigned to look into the case of the dead preacher's wife up in Omeo. So up he went. And while the Methodist congregation was having this meeting to ask Ronald about what he'd been doing. That was when Daniel Mulfay, Detective Mulfay, arrived, hooked up with the local constable, and they went, we've just been given a fantastic opportunity because Lottie Condon is on the farm by herself. Ronald's not going to be there. Her father's not going to be there. We can go and ask her what actually happened. By this stage, the detectives had also interviewed Ronald and he denied any involvement with Lottie Condon. He denied any improprieties of that sort. He denied having anything to do with the death of his wife. But in that interview, he did say, I think she might have been poisoned. And they were like, what? And he was like, just because she got so sick so quick, maybe that was what happened. And that was like, well, that was news to them. He'd never said that before. So they had their suspicions about him. And they took this opportunity to go and interview her and Lottie just spilled the beans. She admitted to the adultery. She admitted to when the relationship had started, all the various times they'd had sex, the creeping around, her sort of, you know, staying at houses near the parsonage and sneaking over there in the middle of the night. She basically just told everything to the detectives on the record. So they took her statement down to the Methodist gathering and they were waiting outside when Ronald stepped out and said, we'd like to interview you. And he's like, well, I've already told you everything. And then they read the statement to him, read Lottie's statement and said, is any of that true? And he said, yes, it's all true. So John Condon, Lottie's father, had said to Ronald, I will stick by you through thick or thin based on what Ronald had said about not having an affair with his daughter. Then it was revealed that he'd lied to his face 
But John Condon nevertheless said, I've been betrayed. I've been shamed by this man. I feel like I cannot even show my face in public. But I gave my word to him that I would support him. So I am going to support him through this. So the next stage was to order the exhumation of Ethel. So Ethel had been buried in Omeo in this little plot, which Ronald had described in his letter to her people as his beautiful resting place. It wasn't a beautiful resting place the morning that they dug her up. So they had the government pathologist there and they set up a table and they cut her up and took all of the evidence down to Melbourne And they gave the jars containing her organs to Dr. Charles Anthony Taylor. He was the uh, chemist who'd become a bit of a star of the police force and prosecutions, and he was to analyse the organs for any traces of poison. By this stage, the detectives had also discovered that Ronald had bought some poisons down in Bansdale. So they went down to see the chemist. The poison that he'd bought was cyanide and prussic acid, And they knew at this point that that was not what had killed Ethel because both of those left really distinctive symptoms. Like if you die from cyanide poisoning, you convulse. You you Mm. know, they actually call people saw horses because their limbs convulse so much before death that they're bent right out of shape. So they knew it wasn't cyanide. Prussic acid also leaves really distinctive sort of marks on the body. They were just doing their due diligence. They knew exactly what they were going to find in the organs because the way she died was completely consistent with arsenic, and that's what they found. Her organs contained 15 and a half grains of arsenic. That was enough to kill a family. And the thing was the arsenic they found in her organs, in her stomach and in her large intestine, was what was still in the body, hadn't been absorbed yet, nor it had been vomited up. So the majority of what she'd actually been given or taken would have been expelled through vomiting. And then whatever had been absorbed had killed her. So she'd been given massive doses of arsenic or had taken them herself. In any event, she'd not died of natural causes. So he was then charged with her murder. Ronald was charged with the murder of his wife. With the arrest of Ronald for something like you know, alleged murder, accused of poisoning his wife, also having an affair. Was this huge news at the time? It was absolutely humongous news all over Australia. It was so lurid. I mean, you know, a wife poisoner is one thing. A wife poisoner who does it because he's having an affair is another thing. And a wife poisoner who's a reverend, Mm. whoa. So the newspapers went berserk for this. I would say outside of the Squizzy Taylor saga, the biggest crime news of the 1920s in Victoria, at least. I mean, the Herald in Melbourne was all over this story. They sent a photographer by car up from Melbourne to Omeo at top speed to take a photo of Ronald Griggs as he came out of the little lock up there. And then the guy got back in the car and burned back down to Melbourne, 400 kilometres, did it in seven and a half hours, which at the time was pretty damn good. And the photo was like, you know, in the paper, in the hands of Victorians an hour later. Wow. Incredibly prejudicial as well because there's a picture of this guy coming out of a cell. I mean, if you're a potential juror, it looks like he's guilty. So there was huge public interest in this and all of the court proceedings, the inquest and the various trials, there'd be hundreds or even thousands of people crowded around outside hoping for a glimpse of Lottie, of Ronald, of anybody involved. Let's go to the first because there are two trials. Ronald goes to trial. How does that play out? Because the defence actually did something that was fairly, I guess you could say, scandalous during that. They called Ronald to the stand, which is not usually what you would do. It's a really big gamble for anybody who's accused of anything to take the stand because, you know, while you think, oh, I can clear my name, you open yourself up to cross-examination. If you look the wrong way as and if you look shifty it can be bad for a jury so it was a big gamble for Ronald to take the stand but on the other hand that's what he'd been trained to do to stand up there to preach to the congregation so he took the stand and he told his version of events now it's worth saying as well but at this time women were not able to be on juries so it was an all-male jury And the defence had eliminated 
any young men from the jury. So it was all middle-aged men who were going to be sitting in, in judgment of Ronald. So you can fairly reasonably say they were quite conservative in their mindsets. I mean, the newspapers actually published all of their names, their ages, their addresses, their religious denominations and their interests. So it was a really different time in terms of media coverage. The other thing that's really worth remembering is that the death penalty was in effect at this point in Victoria. They'd hanged the innocent man who'd been convicted of killing Alma Turchki in 1922. They'd also hanged one of Squizzy Taylor's accomplices for a 1924 murder. So if Ronald Griggs was found guilty, he would automatically get the death penalty. Now, there was a good chance that the executive would commute that to life in prison, but it wasn't guaranteed. So if you're on a jury at this time in a murder trial, and you are going to vote guilty, then you are potentially putting a man's neck in the noose. If you're wrong about that, then you're party to killing an innocent man. So it actually made juries less likely to convict in capital cases. I'd rather see a guilty man go free than an innocent man go to the gallows. So that would weigh heavily on the jury. Ronald got up, he told his story. He said, you know, what we've heard, that Ethel came home, that She'd become sick. He'd done everything he could to take care of her. He had no idea how the arsenic had gotten into her system. There had been none found in the house. He hadn't had any. He didn't know where she would have got some to take some herself. It was all a terrible mystery for Ronald. He admitted to his indiscretions with Lottie. He admitted lying about that. But, you know, as the defence would argue, being an adulterer and a liar is not the same as being a murderer. But when he's up there, supposedly now telling the truth under oath, the jury also has it in their minds that this is a man who's told a whole lot of lies previously to the detectives initially, to his lover's father, to everybody, his wife, his wife's family. He's lied, he's lied, he's lied. But now he's supposedly telling the truth. We've already alluded to the fact that there's a second trial. So the jury in this trial, they couldn't reach a verdict when we do look at the trial and the evidence, do you think that's a fair result? Were there still a lot of question marks that were left unanswered? It's very difficult to prove poisoning beyond a reasonable doubt. So here are other scenarios. Ethel realises that her husband is not going to come back into the marriage, is not going to give up Lottie. So she gets some arsenic in Tasmania. And on the way up, she takes it thinking, you know, what? when I get there, I'm going to be sick and he's going to take pity on me and that'll bring us back together. So with arsenic, say if you took 10 grains of arsenic, you would probably absorb maybe one and throw up a lot of the rest of it. So you'd probably survive that first dose. You'd just be sick. You'd have to actually take repeated doses to build up the amount that's going to kill you and destroy your organs. So she might have decided that she was going to make herself feel sick or be sick to get her husband's sympathy. She might have had the arsenic with her, and when they had their reunion in Omeo, it had gone badly, and she'd just swallowed a huge dose, and that had been what killed her. Even more far-fetched is that someone on the ferry, some maniac or some maniac in Melbourne had just dosed her. If you put it into a cup of white tea, it would be invisible. It has no taste. It has no real colour. It has no real odour. So it was possible that she'd taken it herself or that someone else had dosed her. Now, arguing against that, of course, is that there was no arsenic found in the house. So if she'd taken this arsenic, what had she done with the cup that it was in it might show traces or the piece of paper she'd had it in it might show traces. How had she disposed of that? How had she also given herself the second massive dose of arsenic when she was already so sick she could barely move? So there was a lot pointing towards Ronald's guilt, but there was also wiggle room for reasonable doubt. So that was what the jury was considering. Later it would be reported that 10 of the jurymen had wanted to convict and two had been uncertain. But, of course, you only need one to be uncertain. So he was ordered for a retrial. How did the retrial go? Was there any new evidence 
The only new evidence was that Lottie was called to the stand this time. She hadn't been called in the first trial because the argument was she wasn't going to say anything she hadn't already said in the statement. Of course, everybody wanted to see Lottie take the stand in open court. You know, there was huge interest in the second trial in Melbourne. There was a rush, a really unseemly rush, women and men punching each other out to get into the public gallery to get seats. VIPs, people who knew people, were given, you know, seats in special areas. There were massive crowds outside, like you know, so big that while the jury was deliberating, they could actually hear the people outside discussing the case and the cops had to move them on. So when Lottie took the stand, it was like, oh, my God, what's she going to say? And she didn't say anything. It was basically her giving her name and then Ronald was asked, you know, is that Lottie Condon? And he said, yes. It was a stunt to show the jury and to show the court who she was, what she looked like, why he might be infatuated with her, what lengths he might go to to be with her. The evidence was pretty much the same. Now, in Ronald's corner in both of these trials was another really colourful character, George Maxwell. He'd been a federal parliamentarian for over a decade. He was a big guy. Robert Menzies would call him the finest criminal barrister he'd ever met. And he gave these incredibly erudite defence of Ronald and laid out all the other possibilities in terms of how the arsenic might have gotten into Ethel's system. Why would Ronald do this? What possible real motive would he have to kill his wife? You know, yes, he's infatuated with this girl, but that didn't make him a murderer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he also really cleverly cross-examined the Crown witnesses in terms of the scientific evidence. You know, there was also the suggestion that the pharmacist in Omeo, when Ronald had gone to get the over-the-counter medication, had accidentally given arsenic instead of the medicine. And that was possible because, you know, at the time, pharmacists had poisons in their cabinets that people could get for using against feral dogs and so forth. You had to sign a register to get them. They were quite tightly controlled, but there was arsenic in this guy's pharmacy. So was it possible that this guy on New Year's Day having been, you know, drunk the night before, had accidentally given arsenic instead of stomach settlers. This guy was a pharmacist of 50 years standing in the town. He vehemently denied there was any possibility that this had happened, but did it. Yeah. George Maxwell, the barrister, also took apart the evidence of Dr. Crawford Mollison and also Charles Taylor, the chemist, saying they had testified that there would have had to have been several large doses administered because they'd found arsenic in her stomach but also in her large intestine so the stuff in her stomach had clearly only been ingested in a few hours earlier the barrister george maxwell produced a 1870s forensics book which said it's quite possible for one large dose of arsenic to end up in various parts of the body rather than having necessarily been administered at separate times so this backed up the idea that she could have taken a huge dose of arsenic up to two or three days earlier and it had only started to affect her when she got to the parsonage and that this would account for why arsenic was in different parts of her body. Again, it was unlikely, but it was planting those seeds of reasonable doubt. And again, Ronald testified and again, you know, acquitted himself quite well as a bewildered, grieving husband who had sinned in so many ways, but not in this way. The jury retired. They came back and he was not guilty. Was that shocking to this huge audience or were they kind of expecting it by that point? When you read these cases of these trials, when people are believed to be innocent, usually the gallery erupts in cheers and clapping and that didn't happen. In fact, after Ronald was acquitted, George Maxwell walked out. Really? Ronald did shake hands with the junior counsel but Maxwell just left. And what Maxwell had actually said at one point was he was saying to the jury that you're not finding him innocent. You're saying that there's not enough to conclude that he's guilty. So that almost indicated that Maxwell himself believed that Ronald was guilty, but there wasn't enough evidence to actually sustain a conviction, which is a really sort of fine legal hair to split, but Everybody is entitled to a defence. 
So I think it was quite shocking for everybody because it really did seem like a slam dunk. Ethel's people had testified, you know, that she was in good spirits in Tasmania. She had told them she was going back to reunite with her husband and they were going to go off to the islands. Lottie had testified in, or said in her statement, Ronald had told her that his wife was coming back and they were going to get a divorce. So there was all of these inconsistencies. And one of the things that came out in the second trial that didn't come out in the first trial was how she took her tea. Ronald told the court definitively that he and Ethel only ever drank black tea. Then they actually got her mother up who said Ethel only drank white tea. Her neighbour said Ethel only drank white tea. The stewardess who'd served her on the boat over from Tasmania said she took her tea with milk. Now, this seems like a, a small thing, but arsenic is not soluble, particularly in room temperature water or fluid, so it needs to be mixed with something warm, hot, like tea. It's white, and if you mix it in with black tea, you're going to see granules in there because it won't all dissolve. But if it's mixed with white tea, it's invisible. The barrister, Maxwell, argued, well, you know, no one actually saw how she took her tea inside the parsonage when she was with her husband. Was she one of those people who, if you drink black tea, I'll drink black tea? Well, it would seem that it was the only time she drank black tea was with him. It seems far more likely that she did drink white tea and that he'd put arsenic in her tea and had dosed her repeatedly over those 48 hours. And then, of course, you know, he'd summoned the doctor and summoned the neighbour because he needed witnesses to her being sick. If he just rocked into town on the 3rd of January and said, my missus is dead, there would have been an automatic inquest. They would have found the arsenic immediately. If he had have actually laid low with Lottie Condon for a couple of months, he would have got away, or he did get away with it. There wouldn't have been an inquest. She wouldn't have been exhumed. They would never have found the arsenic. They would have thought she died of natural causes, as they initially did. He would have been free to marry Lottie, no harm, no foul. He's a widower rather than a divorcee, and he could have gone on to be one of the great Methodist preachers of the 20th century. But he is still a free man. He isn't behind bars. What became of Ronald Griggs? So he still had supporters who looked after him. He found it extraordinary that he could walk around in Werribee unnoticed. He expected that he'd be, you know, mobbed because the court had been besieged by spectators. What he did was he moved to Adelaide and he had a friend there who he'd met overseas during war service and this guy took him in and Ronald decided that he wanted to be a preacher again. So he forged papers. He got his old papers and he altered them and he gave himself the name of Graham Maxwell. So he gave himself the surname of his defence barrister and he presented himself to the local Presbyterian church in Adelaide and they took him on. So there's this new preacher named Graham Maxwell towards the end of 1928 who's doing really well as a Presbyterian minister and, you know, the congregation are really taking to him. And then someone's like, hang on a second, this paperwork looks a bit dodgy. And they check it against the records at Melbourne University and find that there's a number that's been sort of scribbled out and it's quite obvious. And by actually just checking the original number, they go, oh, my God, it's Ronald Griggs. So he is unceremoniously drummed out of the Presbyterian church then. I mean, the gall of the man to actually like start to preach again under a new name, and he's preaching all the same sermons about being a good Christian, <laughs> you know, respecting marriage vows and all that sort of stuff. And so this makes, you know, again, front page news everywhere. He gives more interviews, and in the interviews he says, you know, oh, the good news is Lottie's almost 21 now. We're going to get married, and I can't wait. As soon as she turns 21, we're going to go to the altar. That was not true. Her father had forbidden her from having anything more to do with him, and they moved away. After living for generations at Omeo, they moved away to up near Wagga Wagga. So you can read that it ruined their family's reputation. Ronald didn't marry Lottie. He ended up working sort of various jobs under assumed names, became a milkman in Adelaide. He did marry again in 1932. He didn't have another child, and he and his wife lived in suburban anonymity for the next 40-odd years until they both passed away. But his daughter, who'd been sent back to Tasmania to live with his people, grew up thinking 
that her mother had died of natural causes and her father just wasn't interested. And she eventually learned the truth. And when she herself got married and had children, she wrote a letter after the birth of her first child to Ronald to sort of make contact with him. And he wanted nothing to do with her. So she never knew her father, which on the balance of things may be a good result for her. It is strange timing that we are speaking about this at the moment because there is a poisoning alleged murder happening right now in our newspapers. A woman named Erin Patterson, she's been charged with murder and attempted murder in Victoria, accused of serving poison mushrooms to her family. I feel like you don't hear about a poison as a murder weapon that often. Do you think it's that that kind of draws people in as well? In this case, certainly, and poison is usually described as being a female weapon rather than a male weapon. So there is another curious part to this Ronald Griggs case is that it was a man using poison. In the 20th century and and before, poisonings were far, far more common. Poisons were far more available. Every house had rats. There were feral dogs, feral cats all over the place. People had backyard gardens with vegetables, so there were rabbits everywhere. So ordinary people had use for poison on a daily basis. So there were poisons available. The classic cases were the mid-1940s, mid-1950s, thallium poisonings around Australia where wives would poison their bastard husbands with thallium, which was colourless, odourless, tasteless rat poison. You know, you just put a half a teaspoon in his tea every few days and he'd gradually get sicker and sicker. His hair would fall out and he'd die. And if it happened over a long enough period, no one would question it. And there were a lot of these poisonings. Many women were convicted. Many more weren't because it's really difficult to prove where the poison came from, who put it in the drink, when, et cetera, unless you've got really hard evidence, as in a trace of poison on a teaspoon, on a cup, fingerprints on that cup, someone saying, oh, I saw Mrs. Smith give the cup to her husband. I mean, obviously, if it's happening over breakfast in a a suburban house, there just aren't those witnesses. So poisoning was a lot more common. I'm sure there are a lot of people who were poisoned and it was never detected. And also, you know, forensics back in the day were not quite as advanced as they are now. But even so, you know, you exhume a body, you can still find traces of some poisons, arsenic for one, thallium. But poisons like cyanide and so forth were much harder to detect. But, of course, they also then left, you know, people in convulsions and so forth. So it was a little more obvious up front. These days it seems to be a far rarer crime, poisoning murder. Back in the day, far more common. Thanks to Michael for assisting us to tell this story. If you'd like to hear more of Michael's work, you can find his Forgotten Australia podcast, which looks into various forgotten murders in our episode description, along with his book, The Murder Squad. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support our work, Become part of the community that makes you feel seen, heard and understood like never before. Subscribe to Mamma Mia. There's a link in the episode description. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.